Let us now come to a quite different set of schemes, namely four-dimensional schemes. This is section 4.3, IREC, which stands for implicit regularization. And FPR, which stands for four-dimensional renormalization. But uh, I mean, the name sounds extremely general, but it's a very specific method. So in this case, let me give uh, the names. So IREC uh, was invented in a series of papers already uh, before it, the year 2000, uh, mainly in Brazil by uh, several uh, protagonists. So I highlight in particular Adriano Cercilia, who was here for several years as a postdoc. Um, and worked also with us, and uh, he is now one of the young, uh, not so young anymore, uh, but younger members of that collaboration. And this was invented by Roberto Pitau. Developed by Roberto Pitau. And both are, um, have share a lot of uh, properties, so these are purely four-dimensional schemes. But BPHC is also four-dimensional. So there are many four-dimensional schemes. However, those particular schemes um, are different from uh, BPHC. Uh, and uh, I will not mention this any further, but in textbooks you often find Pauli Villar uh, regularization which is also purely four-dimensional or cut-off uh, regularization. They are different from all these um, uh, older four-dimensional schemes. And the point of all these schemes is that they should preserve as much as possible symmetries, in particular gauge invariants. So none of those other four-dimensional schemes um, is able to preserve gauge invariants of QCD, for example, smoothly. Uh, it's always broken at intermediate steps. And those are attempts on establishing four-dimensional methods which nevertheless preserve gauge invariance. So that is a very important goal. And similarly, supersymmetry, which is of course tied to four dimensions, um, that should, if possible, also be preserved by those schemes. So these are the basic goals behind those schemes. Preserve symmetries, in particular gauge invariants. I'm not saying that uh, they fulfill this goal because this is also part of the ongoing research on these schemes, but I mean, of course, they look promising in this respect and they are definitely much better than any of those older alternatives. Uh, this is one goal, and uh, second, uh, the goal is also that the calculations are in practice then actually simpler than BPHD calculations. On the other hand, the uh, second goal in particular uh, in connection with IREC is that uh, these schemes offer alternative ways to study fundamental quantum field theory properties like anomalies or um, supersymmetry properties and so on, which are maybe tied to four dimensions. And um, so in particular, this implicit nature of the regularization kind of makes it a general scheme which highlights properties uh, which might be true in many particular schemes um, uh, in a unified setting. What is the basic idea of both schemes? 
the basic idea can be written down in a very simple way. Namely, if you have a loop integral in momentum space of some integrand, k plus p square minus m square, then let's say p is an external momentum, m is the mass, um, and k is the loop momentum. Then this uh, integral is divergent because it has a certain degree of divergence. So in this simple case, it's degree of divergence two. But uh, let's say this goes on. Then this has some degree of divergence. And now you can simplify the propagator by adding and subtracting something so that uh, you split um, the expression into some finite part plus a divergent part, but the divergent part is simpler. So uh, the basic idea is this. So in, in this case, you could subtract, for example, that and add it back. Right? Now you have added and subtracted something, so you have not changed your expression. But this object does not depend on the external momentum anymore, so it's a constant from the point of view of momentum. And now if you bracket it in this way, then you have separated it in, in a way which has the following structure. So that has the same degree of divergence as before. So if it was divergent before, then this is still divergent, but uh, simpler. And in this case, it does not depend on P anymore. So it's a polynomial in the external momentum of degree zero. And what is this? Let's calculate it. So this is a product of these two denominators that we call it d1 times d2, so these two denominators. And in the numerator, there is a cancellation happening because you have k square. Uh, so if you bring it to this form, then you have uh, in the numerator the difference between the two denominators. And in the difference, the mass cancels, the k square cancels, and what remains is only minus uh, p square minus p dot k. That's all. So uh, the degree of divergence of this, it has four powers of k in the denominator and only one power in the numerator. So it has, uh, this has degree of divergence uh, one over k square. And this has now one over k to the third power. So it's a reduced degree of divergence. So in this case, uh, it would still be divergent, but uh, now you can go on. You can go on and apply the same uh, relationship to uh, this denominator, which is more complicated and so on. So iteratively, you can uh, bring your degree of divergence to, to lower and lower values until you get something finite. And what you split off is always simpler. So you can separate your divergent integral into something which is finite and has the full dependence on masses and momenta, and something divergent, which is much simpler and has maybe no dependence on momenta or is a polynomial in the momenta. So this is the basic idea, and uh, you can do this before thinking even about integration. And then you do not need to specify your regularization, which means you can do this, what is called implicit regularization. So in implicit regularization, you would say, we do not say what we uh, impose as a regularization, but we do those algebraic steps. And at the end, we have these divergent expressions, which are just left standing there in the equation as a, an object. It might be calculated in any regularization you want, but we do not want to know what the result is. Anyway, we know that it doesn't depend on the external momentum, for example, in this case. And the basic idea of FDR is uh, then to apply a specific recipe to those divergent expressions. In the simplest case, set the divergent parts which depend on nothing, set them to zero. Then uh, it's like adding a counter term which subtracts this, but you just set it to zero as a definition and then you have renormalized your expression and the finite remainder uh, it has then the full dependence on all masses and momenta. So these are the basic ideas. So let's say the basic idea is to apply such relations before integration. <coughs> 
separation of a finite part with full P and M dependence and the divergent part which is simpler. Good. So that's the basic idea. And now let me just uh, give you some uh, selection of details of those schemes. I will not uh, give you all the details and uh, I will also not explain the subtle differences between the two schemes in great detail, but let me highlight the following items. First, if you do this, then in this particular case we had here a mass of um, the original quantum field theory, but um, you might also want to simplify this once again, for example, you might uh, get rid of, want to get rid of the explicit mass dependence and um, apply additional rules like add and subtract minus one over k square plus one over k square and so on. And uh, then this again reduces the degree of divergence and what you remain with is something which does not even have a mass dependence but is still divergent. So this could also be done. Or you only do this and get rid of the mass dependence, but you don't care about the momentum. So there are various uh, ways to do it, but if you end up with something like this, and uh, this is often unavoidable, then you have a problem because this is not only UV, but also infrared divergent, because here, uh, if k goes to zero, the integrand diverges badly at k equals zero, and therefore the integral is divergent also for that additional reason. And introducing spurious infrared divergences is not a clever idea, so they need to be uh, tamed. And because of that, all of these schemes uh, in general need to introduce a fictitious additional mass. And they call it mu, and then this fictitious mass would be introduced in this way, minus mu square minus mu square, then you have an identity, and then you would say, okay, uh, that mu is a reference mass which is fixed once and for all, and then uh, all the actual mass dependence on physical masses can be replaced by integrals which only depend on your single fictitious mass mu, and uh, finite remainders which depend on uh, the physical mass and also on mu. So this is what both of these schemes need to do. And then uh, they also introduce a mass scale like dimensional regularization and actually one um, uh, can relate final expressions which depend on mu to the mu dependence in dimensional regularization. So first of all, this is needed to avoid infrared divergences, and then this mu appears similarly to mu in dimensional regularization, which is nice and allows to connect the schemes. Then, as I said, in uh, IREC, implicit regularization, the specific idea is to split off so-called basic divergent integrals BDIs as they call it and they are not evaluated which is what makes the scheme implicit and then one can uh, systematize the structure of these basic divergent integrals and uh, one can show that all the, these basic divergent integrals um, have the form of either scalar integrals, like one over k square minus this uh, mass scale mu square to some power n, or surface integrals. Surface integral is an integral over k of a total derivative d by dk 
of a total derivative of something which might also have a numerator now, let's say k nu uh, or something else, divided by k square minus mu square to some power. Okay. And uh, then one can discuss, for example, uh, specifically the surface integrals. Surface integrals would often vanish and in dimensional regularization they vanish uh, always because of this translation invariance of the loop momentum. So uh, all of these would be zero in dimensional regularization and also here one can discuss that the scheme acquires some additional nice properties if one sets all these surface integrals to zero and one can um, discuss the theory behind this. And uh, if that is done, then uh, it is not as implicit anymore, but it is constrained implicit regularization with the constraint that surface integrals are zero like in dimensional regularization. So this is the basic idea of IREC and FDR, as I already said, is uh, similar. But uh, it makes a specific choice which integrals uh, here are set to which values, in particular which integrals are simply set to zero. And uh, this setting to zero, you can view it as adding a certain counter term, which is a polynomial in the external momenta, um, or as a direct renormalization procedure like in BPHC forest formula. Um, but one has to look uh, quite carefully at the details of which integrals are set to zero at which places in the calculation in order to get a consistent scheme. So that is really a tricky part of this F FDH scheme, uh, FDR scheme, sorry. So in both schemes, for example, what one needs to take care of is uh, how is this view actually introduced in detail? So of course, mu is introduced in the denominators here to extract the divergences without generating infrared divergences. So it's introduced here in the denominator, but uh, one also introduces it in specific places in the numerator. And one does that in particular in order to preserve gauge invariance. Again. So let me just illustrate this with QED. In QED you have these Feynman diagrams. The left diagram is a vertex correction, electron, electron, photon, and the right is an electron self energy with a photon loop. And these two diagrams are related by gauge invariance and uh, technically by ward identities for QED. And these water identities um, tell us, for example, that um, uh, the derivative of this self-energy with respect to the external momentum is equal to that one loop diagram uh, if the photon momentum goes to zero. So relations like this correspond to gauge invariance and they should be preserved if possible by the regularization scheme to make it better than BPHC and so on, okay? So, and uh, this relationship that I mentioned comes from a cancellation. So here you see, of course, many elements in the diagram are the same, but the difference is here you have one electron propagator, here you have two electron propagators and a vertex. And the relationship comes from a cancellation where this vertex here in the numerator effectively cancels the second propagator. And then because of this cancellation, there is a kind of equality or relationship. So if you introduce mu in the denominator, you should also introduce it at the right place in the numerator to preserve this cancellation. So relation requires a certain cancellation of numerator 
divided by denominator. And because of this, uh, we need to introduce mu at the right spots, also in the numerator. And this is a technical detail uh, which is um, necessary to take into account in order to um, really get this desired advantage of the schemes. So, but of course, this makes it uh, not completely trivial uh, to formulate what you really have to do in complete generality. A second item that you need to be careful with is this uh, sub-integration consistency. Which is this um, requirement that if you have a sub-diagram, then uh, the result of the renormalized sub-diagram should be equal no matter where you put it, if it's independent of the embedding, whether you calculate it in isolation or as a sub-diagram of a bigger graph or of an even bigger graph. After renormalization, the sub-diagram has one unique value and it should be always the same no matter what uh, the embedding is. And that needs to be uh, made sure in those schemes as well uh, in view of all these re um, replacement rules, this is not obvious. So, and uh, so let me summarize here some statements on the schemes. So I would say uh, both schemes have been successfully applied in many cases. one loop and two loop calculations in QED, QCD, uh, supersymmetric theories with gamma 5 and so on. By the way, I think I forgot to mention the gamma 5 problem in the context of dimensional regularization. What happened? So I think I completely forgot that. So let me do that uh, another time. Um, sorry for that, but let's go on here. There is a statement that I read is equivalent to BPHC. There are papers about this. Age invariance is established in many concrete cases, but not really in general. In IREC, where uh, the loop integrals are not set to zero but kept implicit, uh, and where you can distinguish between surface integrals and non-surface integrals, there is an interesting um, study um, of the connection of uh, symmetries like gauge invariance to uh, the surface integrals being zero. And that, in turn, is related to momentum routing invariance. Remember that we also discussed momentum routing some weeks ago uh, in the general context, because when we set up alpha parametrization, uh, then we also need to fix some particular momentum routing. And uh, uh, at that point, it was obvious that the momentum routing doesn't matter for our alpha parametrization. And we characterized what are the um, sets of possibilities of how we can route uh, the loop momenta through the Feynman diagrams. Okay, and so in dimensional regularization, it is clear that uh, we have this momentum routing invariance, but in other schemes, that is not clear. And so here, uh, for example, the momentum routing um, matters if those surface integrals are not zero, which might happen in some regularizations. But if they are zero, then we have momentum routing invariance and that uh, is at the heart of proving the um, existence of some symmetries. So um, in FDR, in particular, uh, the connection to dimensional regularization has been studied quite extensively in the past few years. 
and uh, in both schemes also connections to other schemes. have been investigated as well. Let us very briefly discuss the gamma 5 problem, which is actually a very interesting topic and uh, also a topic of current research here in Dresden, but also elsewhere. Um, and we can discuss it uh, first in the context of dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction but then actually also in the context of these four-dimensional schemes like IREC and FDR. But traditionally, this problem is known in the context of dimensional regularization, so let me tell you what it means. In four dimensions, we have three equations connected with the gamma-5 matrix, namely the anti-commutator between gamma-5 and all gamma mu matrices is zero. Um, then we have the trace of gamma 5 with the product of four different gamma matrices is uh, four i times the epsilon tensor in four dimensions. So it's a non-zero result. And of course the trace operation is cyclic. These are three equations, let's say one, two, three. And the point is for our d-dimensional gamma matrices, the equations become inconsistent. So that is inconsistent to have all three equations simultaneously. And because of that, the question is, how should we treat gamma 5 in a d-dimensional regularization? And we have not discussed it so far, but that was the reason why I never mentioned electroweak um, uh, theories, because uh, in QED and QCD gauge invariance holds on the regularized level, but in the electroweak theory we need gamma 5, because we have left and right handed fermions uh, which are treated differently. They are connected with gamma 5 in the Lagrangian and uh, therefore we have here a problem. So where does this inconsistency come from? So suppose we have really uh, this anti-commutator also in D dimensions. And D is now arbitrary as we discussed before. Then we can write down the following trace operation. Trace of gamma 5 and four gamma matrices. Gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma rho, gamma sigma. And now we can evaluate the trace and show that uh, it must be zero if we have cyclicity of the trace. So we start with d times the trace. And in the end, we will prove that d times the trace is equal to four times the trace. Okay, that will be the result. In, and then since d is arbitrary, unequal to four, uh, it means the trace must be zero. So how does it work? We write it d times the trace, we put in gamma alpha, gamma alpha. Let me use here a simplified notation for the product of these four gamma matrices, but gamma alpha, gamma alpha contracted gives, because of our d-dimensional relationships, just d times the unit matrix, and therefore this is an identity. And now we can use uh, the anti-commutation relations of gamma alpha and gamma five. So this here, if we uh, commute it uh, to that point, we get a minus sign. And then we can use anti-commutation relations between gamma alpha and all the other gamma mu's. And in this way, we obtain uh, every time we do an anti-commutator, we get, let's say here in the first case, um, two times g alpha mu minus the opposite order gamma mu gamma alpha. So, and to make a long story short, you can apply such commutation relations um, as many times until, so you get always some terms with metric tensors and uh, then alpha gets pulled through to the right. So then alpha is first here, then it's here, then it's here, 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 and eventually you stop and then you arrive at an expression where you have gamma alpha, then gamma five, and then all the gamma matrices, gamma mu, mu, rho, sigma, and uh, the other gamma alpha is here. 
at the last position. And uh, how many times do you need to do it? You pull it uh, around the gamma 5 then around the other four gamma matrices. So you, each time you get a minus 1, so overall you get a minus uh, 1 of that expression. And then each time you do this step, you get some additional traces um, uh, where you have a metric tensor and the metric tensor can be contracted with that gamma alpha here. So this term would give gamma mu here, so gamma mu times gamma 5 and then times the other remaining gamma mu. So you get traces with gamma 5 times uh, 4 gamma matrices. Uh, with different orderings and so on. And so now you can first of all use cyclicity. Then cyclicity means that this gamma alpha can be put here. Then you have gamma alpha, gamma alpha again like in the beginning and you get minus p times the same trace that you started with. And uh, let me not go into detail, but you can uh, easily show that all of those traces boil down to eight times the original trace gamma five times uh, the other four gamma matrices. And uh, plus traces with gamma five and uh, fewer gamma matrices. And so you can uh, also show that they are zero uh, using the same trick as in four dimensions and then you have uh, established what I said, namely d times the trace is equal to minus d times itself minus eight times itself. So you bring it to the form, uh, sorry, here you have a plus, d uh, or two times d minus eight times the trace is zero. Therefore, the trace must be zero. And we have used uh, cyclicity and the anti-commutativity um, and uh, therefore, if we, we assume two equations, you can, um, the implication is that the third one is wrong. So the three equations are inconsistent in four dimensions and that is the heart of the gamma five problem. And uh, the origin is of course the fact that gamma five is really tied to strictly four dimensions. So it is related to chirality in the four-dimensional Lorentz group. And it can also be written as gamma 5 is equal to i times the product of gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3 in strictly four dimensions. And also the epsilon tensor relies on index counting so it's a totally anti-symmetric tensor with four indices and uh, that is only possible if uh, you are in strictly four-dimensional space so that each index can take precisely four different values and then uh, this anti-symmetric object is well defined and so all of these, uh, in particular this equation here, uh, makes sense really only in strictly four dimensions and uh, this kind of explains why you have a problem in continuing gamma five to d dimensions. So now if you uh, would say what is now the consequence of this, you could say, okay, uh, I like this equation better than the second one, so I simply uh, accept that the trace is zero, but I uh, keep using this anti-commutation rule. The problem then is that uh, if the trace is zero, you do not, do not have a continuous extrapolation or a continuous limit from d to four dimensions. And uh, then of course your finally renormalized expressions, even for finite expressions, um, uh, do not agree with um, what they should be in four dimensions. For example, then um, you would set to zero entirely certain Feynman diagrams which involve this trace, but those Feynman diagrams might be necessary for unitarity and causality, and therefore uh, setting that to zero 
in all cases would um, violate unitarity and causality of the scheme. So that cannot be done, at least not always. And uh, therefore, the solution or solutions which are proposed in the literature are the following. There is one rigorous solution which is uh, already proposed by Toft and Feldman in their original paper and also uh, promoted by Breiten, Lohner, Meison, which is to set gamma 5 equal to i times gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, also in d dimensions. And remember, our d dimensional space is really infinite dimensional, so the index mu in gamma mu runs from 0 to infinity, so that product is well defined even in our formally d-dimensional space. You can write this down. But now you have really singled out the first four dimensions. They are treated differently from the other dimensions. And that gives rise to the need sometimes to really split, as I said before, objects into a four-dimensional part and the remaining d minus four-dimensional part or this evanescent uh, part. So this comes in particular from here. Now the problem with this is um, that this breaks gate invariance so the simple uh, statement is that the d-dimensional Lagrangian uh, of the electroweak standard model is not gate invariant anymore. Because in order to uh, see this cancellation of the gauge transformation between the vector field and uh, the spinner field, uh, you would need to use some uh, anti-commutation relation between gamma mu's and gamma 5's in d dimensions, and that is not valid anymore. So the anti-commutation relation is now gamma mu with gamma 5 in d dimensions. Uh, you have to distinguish two cases, namely it's uh, zero, um, if mu is equal to 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, or non-zero otherwise. Okay. You can also write down what it is, but it's at least non-zero, and because of that, uh, you break age invariance. So this is one rigorous way to treat it, and in this context, all the proofs and statements and theorems and so on, they are valid. But gauge invariance in the electroweak theory is lost. But now uh, there are many, many uh, tricks in the literature. At least I would call it tricks. Let's say simpler schemes where you ignore the problem as much as possible. So for example, in many Feynman diagrams, the trace does not appear. And then you can hope that uh, you can simply assume the anti-commutation relation without running into problems with inconsistencies. And so this is uh, elaborated a lot, and so a lot of knowledge exists on uh, the range of applicability of these tricks, but uh, they are not ap applicable in all cases, but in a variety of cases. So, but let me simply say, ignore the problem as much as possible. And then, of course, you can always uh, try to find better tricks with a wider range of applicability uh, or study the range of applicability and so on. But these are the two kinds of points of views that you can take with respect to the gamma 5 problem. Now, let me check the time. So we still have 10 minutes to go. And so in these 10 minutes, let me uh, explain the following. These four-dimensional schemes like IREC and FDR, they have been invented in particular in view of the gamma-5 problem. Because you see that uh, this is the single problem which makes uh, d-dimensional regularization awkward. Apart from this, uh, dimensional regularization has really only advantages. But this is maybe the key disadvantage of dimensional regularization. This and uh, similarly, a supersymmetry is also tied to four dimensions. Therefore, this is also affected by this problem and also by uh, the problem of degrees of freedom from before. But uh, because of this, um, 
breaking of gauge invariance in the electroweak theory, which is of course very important, uh, the four-dimensional schemes are very well motivated because then you would have the hope that uh, this gamma-5 problem does not exist since you don't, do not go away from four dimensions. And um, this hope is plausible, but uh, I want to uh, review here a paper which appeared two years ago or three years ago almost, which uh, for me was really a breakthrough and a revelation. The result is negative. But uh, this paper made an extremely clever and simple observation, which boils down to the fact that in four-dimensional schemes, you have essentially the same gamma-5 problem. It's harder to see, and therefore it was kind of overlooked uh, for decades, but, um, but it exists. And let, me, uh, let me show you the essence. Since everything is related to index counting, uh, so you can, uh, that was the observation, you can reduce the basic point to a much simpler consideration and you can go to two dimensions and um, uh, look at such a relation here. Let's say you have some way to renormalize a diagram or a, a loop integral and uh, denoted by R, then you can renormalize a tensor integral with two open Lorentz indices and afterwards contract with a um, metric tensor. So let's do it even in Euclidean space without Minkowski metric. So you have just this contraction. And you can compare it with that contraction where you contract before you do the integral. And then under very reasonable assumptions on your regularization scheme, uh, that does not agree. So there is a mismatch between uh, contracting before or after doing renormalization. Yeah, it's a very simple calculation. And uh, this relation here basically means that again in such regularization schemes, such an index counting, because that is related to index counting again, uh, is not possible. And then uh, this is the core of the problem and uh, one of the consequences is that uh, such schemes also have a gamma-5 problem. So let me just... Um, let me just uh, explain this and give you the reference. So the reference is a paper on the gamma-5 issue in um, four-dimensional schemes. So you can look at the paper, it's very nicely written and it contains this precise calculation which I, uh, let's go through it. So let us imagine you start in two dimensions in Euclidean space uh, with such an integral which is a surface integral. So an integral uh, over a total derivative with respect to the loop momentum in two dimensions. So, okay. Um, and uh, that you have some renormalization prescription, for example, IREC or FDR or something else, um, which should have reasonable properties. And now let's uh, see what properties we actually make use of. So uh, let's evaluate the thing. So the derivative gives rise to two terms. If we take the derivative in the numerator, we get just a G mu nu, or in their language, delta mu nu over k square plus m square, and the second term plus uh, k mu k mu times 2 from the inner derivative times the denominator square. Now, of course, you make use of um, the assumption that uh, renormalization is linear. So you say uh, that this is the same as if you write it like this, okay? So you can split uh, the renormalization of a sum is equal to the sum of the renormalized integrals. So that is a very reasonable property which you would certainly like to have in practical calculations. So let's assume linearity. And then we have here an object um, up to the factor two, let's call it two times I mu nu, 
which is a tensor integral where we have a numerator k mu k nu divided by this denominator. It's still divergent. Uh, degree of divergence is zero, and so uh, that is an interesting integral to consider. And so because of this relation, we have now uh, that. And now a second reasonable um, property of uh, renormalization methods is that surface integrals are zero. As I mentioned before, this is related to momentum routing invariance and a lot of knowledge exists that this is um, a necessary ingredient in proving gauge invariance for QED, QCD, and so on. So even in simple cases like QED, you would need this to be zero in order to have gauge invariance. So you want that, therefore, let's assume our renormalization method makes this zero and has the linearity property. If we have these two properties, no surface integrals and linearity, then we have now an expression for our tensor integral i mu nu. Namely, it is related uh, to minus this integral, which is uh, one half delta mu nu times the tensor integral. So with a minus. Uh, by the way, here there is a minus there. Um, or minus two from the denominator. So we have this relationship. And here this is a prefactor which is not contracted with anything. So clearly we can also assume that this can be pulled out of uh, the integral, which you would definitely do in all practical calculations. Good. Now we can apply this trick which uh, is uh, used in typically in IREC or FDR. Namely, we make this kind of uh, finite d2k. And uh, that means we multiply, in this case, uh, with another factor k squared plus m squared divided by k squared plus m squared. So this is, of course, an identity. And now let us assume what they call numerator denominator consistency. So first of all, this is a mathematical identity. But as I uh, mentioned already some weeks ago, maybe the scheme works by mathematical replacement rules. And then a mathematical replacement rule on that might give something different than a mathematical replacement rule acting on that or something different from a mathematical replacement rule acting on the following, namely k square divided by k square plus m square square plus m square divided by k square plus m square square r. Okay, so but let us assume that the scheme has this numerator denominator consistency, then you can split the integral into these two and then let's also use the linearity again. So we have these two expressions. And then we have an equality between our i mu nu uh, renormalized to uh, such an integral and to uh, such an integral. What is this? This is a finite integral. This is finite because it has degree of divergence minus 2, so d2k over k to the 4. And uh, they computed it for us. The result is pi, non-zero. What is, however, this? This is an integral over k mu, k nu times delta mu nu in the numerator. So this is exactly uh, the expression that you would obtain if you have two open case uh, contracted before renormalization. And that now gives exactly the red box. Namely, we have uh, here established a relationship between our i mu nu and one half Kronecker delta times um, this contracted integral. And uh, you can now massage the equation uh, and plus pi, of course. Um, or, yeah. uh, you can massage the equation by multiplying the left and right hand side overall with Kronecker delta. So then you have here the left hand side 
And if you multiply that with Kronecker delta mu nu, then here you have this Kronecker delta outside the integral, and by index counting, this gives 2 over 2 is 1. And therefore, from uh, combining it, you get the box. And you see that uh, there is this non-commutativity of contracting before or after renormalization. And uh, the box applies to schemes which are linear, have this numerator denominator consistency, allowing you to split it like this, and where surface integrals are set to zero. And all three properties are properties that you have in dimensional regularization. Obviously, so all of this is true in dimensional regularization. And uh, you might not have these properties in BPHC or pauli villar regularization and so on, or cutoff regularization, but uh, those schemes break age invariance. So here, if you assume that you want to set up a four-dimensional scheme which preserves gauge invariance, then you would like to have all these properties, this linearity and uh, the consistency, but then you end up with this problem. So you have this difficulty in using index counting and they show that this gives rise to a gamma 5 problem in very much the same way as in dimensional regularization. So it's a very nice um, negative result which, however, is true and therefore needs to be taken into account in calculations. Okay, so this ends our survey of regularization schemes. Uh, I skipped here the four-dimensional unsubtraction. Maybe I do it next week, um, and maybe we uh, skip it entirely. So thanks a lot for this.